So we are in Ezra 9, and um, we are going to be continuing with our theme of laundry. We're going to keep going with that. So I don't know about you, but perhaps you've had the dreaded experience that I have had occasionally when you somehow miss a red sock in the whites. Have you ever had that? It, or, or a red shirt. It doesn't have to be a sock, you know, but it, you know, somehow it was hiding. It wasn't this obvious. It was like in the folds of the sheets or something, right? And there was like this, you have this baffling experience because you're like, like, first of all, who was wearing a red sock? Who, who had red socks in the house? That's the first question. And, and how did it end up in the white, bright, uh, bright whites is like a mystery, right? And yet, <clears throat> when you opened the washing machine's door and you saw this, you were like, oh no, I know what's happened. This is not good, right? And so you know, as soon as you go to like open the door, you're like, oh no, what am I going to do? Now I have pink whites, right? <clears throat> and you have a decision to make, excuse me. <clears throat> you have a decision to make at that point. You can either Google how to get your clothes white or you can decide that pink is going to be the new white in your house. It's up to you. And a lot of times it depends on how tired you are. You're like, am I really going to mess with this or am I going to leave it alone? But I use this visual this morning for you as an example, a representation of compromise, because we're, we see that in Ezra 9. And compromise can hide in the folds, I'll call them, of our life. You know, and they're, they're in there, but we don't really see it come full circle until things begin to turn pink. Things that were white are no longer. They're a shade, a different shade. They're not white. They're not red. They're something in between. In this case, pink. They've turned pink. They went from white to pink. And I'm going to add my little pink towel here to our little laundry line. And you say to yourself, well, here I am, I'm in compromise. I'm no longer red, I'm no longer white, I'm pink. But let me share with you what God has to say about compromise. According to James 4, 17, he says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so James reminds us that it is sinful to do something when we know it isn't right according to scripture and God's standards. And this verse then becomes a pretty good definition for us of what compromise is. We do something we know isn't right based on scripture, yet we do it anyway. <clears throat> compromise can happen for a myriad of reasons. But in Ezra 9, it happened because the people did not follow God's commands and they married pagan, gen pagan Gentiles who lived in the area. Perhaps they did this because they wanted to avoid conflict or because their consciences were seared toward doing what was right in God's eyes. Or maybe they thought that marrying someone of a different faith would not affect their relationship with God. No matter what the reason, the results were devastating to Ezra. He responded with astonishment and grief. Compromise had crept in, and it was evident in the lives of the people. Ezra turned to the Lord for mercy and help, and to confess their guilt. He went and confessed their group as their guilt as a group. He himself lumped himself within those who had sinned with a prayer of lament. And this is a sobering passage. There is a very stark contrast that we're going to see between the holiness of Ezra and what he desired for the people and their sin-soaked situation. Their choices were made primarily by those in leadership. The sinful choices, the leadership were the people who were doing it. And it left them a shade of pink. And God had commanded them to be white. Ezra describes this sad state of affairs, and therefore, spoiler alert, this is not going to be my typical feel-good, happy message. I'm sorry. I, I, wish, I, I wish every message could be, yay, I'm going to send you home, all excited. Now, this one's a little bit more sobering. <clears throat> I didn't pick the passage. Ask God about it. But it's not my typical message, although I will try to end with some encouragement. However, if you feel as though you have ever experienced deep grief over choices you or someone else you care about has made, you will be able to easily identify with Ezra in this chapter. He doesn't candy coat his pain and his sorrow, and I find that oddly comforting. I think it's because it reminds me that it's okay to feel pain over sinful choices. And Ezra has provided me with an example of how to lament 
what pain I have back to God. The Bible has many psalms of lament, as well as an entire book called Lamentations. It's funny, Stacy and I haven't written a book, a Bible study on Lamentations. It's not like a real popular one with people. We haven't written that one. Not a lot of people really want to do that. It was written by a weeping prophet, for crying out loud. And God gave, but God gave us these scriptures for a reason. And it's an example of what to do when we are grieved. Our world is a broken place. I don't have to tell you that. Even as believers, we are not immune to sorrow and suffering. We experience sickness and death and poverty and neglect and war and trauma and heartbreak over the choices people we love make. What does a believer in Jesus do with all this pain? We take it to the Lord. It is my prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, that as we read through the aching words of Ezra in chapter 9, God will reveal to us what he desires us to learn about the response to sinful compromise and how to lament with the goal of seeking forgiveness and trusting God even when we don't understand what has occurred. So let's open in prayer and ask God for his blessing upon our time together. Lord, this is a, um, a passage from, written by a man who is greatly disturbed. He's sad, and he's broken, and he cries out to you for help. He can't believe what has transpired as he looks at his leadership and says, what have you done? Why? Why would they do it? And he turns to you, <clears throat> excuse me, instead of turning away from you. And he says, I'm grieved. I'm sad. I can't believe how we've compromised. God, may we take a hard look at our own lives. It's easy to see compromise in others. But where have we also compromised? Show us. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. I ask that you would permeate this place to minister and to teach. God, I am just but a mouthpiece. I ask that your Holy Spirit would do the important work here today and meet each woman in the room for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to start in Ezra 9. We're going to read verses 1 to 2. When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons so that the holy seed is mixed with the people of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. Okay, so here we have Ezra, and he has been informed of a, a great sin that has occurred. As we wrote, you, wrote for you in the homework, about four or five months have passed since Ezra and approximately 14 other exiles have arrived in Jerusalem, and during those months, Ezra was likely getting things in order in the temple. And he was probably doing the things that a, a scribe and a priest would do. And then when those things were done, the leaders came to Ezra and gave him some very shocking news. Many of the Levite leaders and some of the Jewish people had intermarried with the local Gentile people who were not devoted wholeheartedly to Yahweh, God alone. And the result was that the holy seed was mixed. Now, some people might read that, especially in today's day and age, and say, what's the big deal, right? How racially insensitive of God to be so narrow-minded. I mean, can you, can you not imagine hearing that today if you said such a thing? If you recall, I spent some time telling you when we, when we studied Ezra 7, I spent some time explaining what a scribe would have done and how he would have spent his days. And if you remember, I told you that he'd learned vast quantities of scripture. He copied it without error. He taught it to others. He knew scripture inside and out. And I believe this knowledge holds the key to understanding Ezra's response to the alarming news reported to him. Ezra took sin seriously 
because he knew scripture. That's going to be the thing that's going to set the bells off in your head when you see things and you're like, whoa, wait, hold on, whoa, 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 that, God, that, God, God's not thrilled with that. The bells go off because you know his word. His word has spoken to you in such a way that you know his heart. And when you see his heart is not happening around you, bells and, and flags go off. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that's what happened for Ezra. He recognized it straight away because scripture revealed sin. Scripture taught its effect on the people. Scripture taught how to confess and repent of sin. Scripture taught how to be restored unto God. And scripture taught how to tremble in reverence for God. And that you're going to see in 9.4. But because his, of his knowledge, he knew scripture, he knew that God had commanded them not to intermarry with pagans. He told them it would turn their eyes and their hearts away from him, that they would worship the gods of their wives. But don't miss this. This is key. God's command against the mixed marriage is not about race. Hear me. It's not about race. It's about faith. Faith was the key for, for God. And we see this. How can I say that? Where, where do I get that from? Okay, take a look at the story of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite woman who married a Jewish man named Boaz, and yet God blessed their marriage because Ruth forsook the Moabites' gods and placed her faith in Yahweh alone. She had had a conversion experience. With God, it isn't about race. It's about faith. And the people of Jerusalem married the Canaanites who were steeped in paganism and they worshiped Baal and Asherah. The pagan practices are described as abominations in verse one. And frankly, if, when I'm explaining to you what that involved, abominations isn't strong enough. It's not a strong enough word when you consider what was involved. Let me explain. Baal was believed to be the god of fertility and destruction. Asherah was the goddess of fertility. In order to gain the blessing of these two, religious prostitution was exercised in the hope of gaining a good harvest or offspring. However, in times of crisis, they offered their children as a sacrifice, sometimes live, to appease the god and goddess in order to obtain personal prosperity. It was heinous, it was wicked, it was beyond an abomination. So why in the world would the Israelites engage in this practice? Why did they conform to the culture? As I see it, it's pretty straightforward. Do you see the letter between the S and the N? It's I. It's the pleasure of I. Compromise often begins because we want something that's going to bring us pleasure and to comfort us. That's what we want. And so we... I is the key. I want something. Therefore, I will disregard what God says and I will conform, albeit incredibly evil to what they conform to, but I will conform to it because it comforts I. That's a sobering reality. And I'm as guilty as the next person. It's not like I'm, I'm pointing the finger at you guys. I got, I got my own stuff, trust me. But we have to look at what's motivating our individual compromise and choose to repent and turn from it. The enemy is laughing at our foolishness. Do you ever really consider that? I mean, do you ever really think about that? When you're compromising, the enemy is laughing at you because you are no longer white. You are no longer red. You are pink. I don't want the enemy laughing at me. And as Stacy taught us last week, Ezra's heart was different. He wanted to please God more than his own comfort or his own pleasure. And so when he heard the news about the people, he had an overt physical reaction. Physical. Let's read what he did in verses three through five. So when I heard this thing, I tore my garments and my robe and I plucked out some of the hair on my head and my beard and I sat down astonished. And then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting, having torn my garments and my robe, and I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. 
I know Ezra didn't wear shorts and a t-shirt, but it's the best picture I could find. I'll try to lighten it up a little. I know it's, this is a heavy duty message, I get it, but it is what it is. If you have ever received disturbing, undesirable, or astonishing news, you can appreciate the severity of Ezra's response. You may not have ripped your clothes or torn out your hair, but perhaps the inside of your body felt like you had been torn in two. When great stress washes upon the shores of our life, our body feels it. When Ezra heard this news, he was in utter disbelief. Maybe you can relate. Maybe you thought, maybe Ezra thought, how could they? Why would they? And the leadership was the greatest offender? Because Ezra was sold out for God, there were no, no words for him initially. You ever people say, I had no words. I had no words. Well, at least that's what I say, because I talk a lot. And so I go, hey, I had no words. I had, that, that's saying something. I had no words. I was just astonished. And he was beyond baffled. The Levite leaders were given a privileged position before God, and that meant they had incredible responsibility. Yet the priests did not honor their positions with holy living. But instead, as we're going to learn next week in chapter 10, more than 100 of them had intermarried and disobeyed God's laws. They should have led by example, knowing that other people were watching them, but instead they compromised. Ezra did not hold back his emotions. What his heart felt, he expressed with his actions. And two things stood out in this section of, of, of scripture. One was that Ezra's actions spoke loudly to me. And his personal sense of responsibility also stood out to me. When I hear about sinful choices, I tend to somewhat be indifferent today, which is, is shocking. I, I shouldn't be, but sadly I am. And I think that less and less astonishes me. Anybody? Am I alone? Yeah, less and less astonishes us. And I think that's because mainstream culture has desensitized us and we seem to tolerate anything and everything, no matter how evil it is. The things God has called sin, we're celebrating. We're embracing. It's acceptable. It's very confusing to me. Anybody else find that very confusing? The more I live here, the more I realize I don't belong here. And because we're so desensitized towards sin, we no longer have a proper response toward compromise. We tend to minimize it, ignore it, go away unaffected by it. And if we do react, well, we only do that in private because we don't want others to think we are judgmental or intolerant. And the more we grow in godliness, the more sin should shock us and astonish us. We cannot control other people's reactions, their actions or, the, or their reactions, neither. We can vote, and I know after yesterday, or well, I'm sorry, Tuesday, I know we're all probably a little questioning that, that action, but we still can vote and we should. We should vote, we can teach our children God, God's word, which we should do. We can live out our convictions based on scripture. But probably for me, the most important one is to care less about what others think and be more concerned about what God thinks. And I should ask myself, am I more focused on others' sin or my own? Where am I compromising? The other thing from this passage that stood out to me was Ezra's personal responsibility for the sin of the group. I mean, instead of worrying about himself, he pleaded on behalf of the people and included himself with their sin. Why would he do this? It wasn't like he married a pagan wife. My conclusion to that one was that he identified with the nation as a whole. He saw himself as a part of the problem as much as he was a part of the solution. How about you and me? When we pray, do we pray for our nation and its sinful behaviors as if they were our own? Do we plead for mercy and forgiveness? Do we, are we genuinely grieved over what's happening on the soil of our land? Do we see ourselves as part of the problem and the solution? It was interesting to me when I considered this because 
we are part of the problem and we are part of the solution. And one of the things we can do that no one is stopping us from doing yet is that we can pray. On your handout, there's a pink piece of, uh, there's a pink box, like what's on this slide. And I put that there for you as sort of a challenge. What if we began our daily prayer time with the verse written by Ezra in 2 Chronicles 7.14, which says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And then we could go on to specifically pray for seven primary centers of influence in our country. And I got this from um, the National Day of Prayer, these seven centers, our government, our military, our media, <laughs> please pray for them, our business, our education, our church, and our family. And on your handout, you have that pink box that has like dots around it. You can cut it out and you can pray it. Or if you're more modern, like my kids, th what they would do is download an app and the app would give them what to do. And so there's an app actually that I've recently started using that I, I kind of like, and it's called Bible Memory, and it's, it's on your handout. So you can go there, you can download verses, and it kind of like quizzes you and helps you to memorize scripture. So it's actually a pretty, pretty solid site. So if you want to do it that way too. Um, but no matter how you do it, we should be faithfully praying for our nation as Ezra prayed for Israel. Because after he sat astonished, at three o'clock, which was the time of the evening sacrifice, Ezra fell before the Lord and spread out his hands to God. And he did what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says. Let's read what he prayed. And he said, this was his lament, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, oh my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty for our iniquities. We, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, to, and to humiliation, as it is this day. And now, for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a peg in a holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia, to revive us, to repair the house of the Lord our God, to rebuild its ruins, to give us a wall in J Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O oh God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by your servant and the prophet, saying the land which you are entering to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the peoples of the land, with the abominations which have filled it from one end to the other with impurity. And now, therefore, do not give your daughters as wives for their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace nor prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us such deliverance as this, should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us so that there would be no remnant nor survivor. O oh Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have left, and for we are left as a remnant. As it is to this day, here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. I mean, talk about sobering, holy moly, and how much of that, when I read that, this was written how many years ago, and yet do we not stand in a similar place today? And what a picture we have of Ezra turning to God for help. How easy it would have been for Ezra to have a different reaction because sorrow can be so disorienting. We don't understand why things have unfolded the way they have. Most people don't come out of a season of grief feeling capable and wise. Some of us even turn away from God myself included. 
When we are in pain, God desires that we turn toward him and not away from him. As return to the Lord with a prayer of lament over the compromise of the Israelites. Lamenting is something new for me. I just recently wrote my very first lament to God. In the past, I felt like lamenting and raising questions about God and what he's allowed felt wrong to me because it felt like I was questioning God and his decision making. And perhaps for some people, it sounds like it was a pity party. I was having a pity party. And so I just decided it might just be best not to bring that pain and just look at the bright side and not look at the pain that I would, or even acknowledge sometimes the pain that I would feel. And then I was greatly encouraged to read that Jesus lamented. When he was on earth, he lamented three times that I know of. He lamented over Jerusalem in Matthew, in Matthew 23, as he was entering in on a donkey. He lamented over the fact that they wouldn't, they, did, they missed the day, Israel missed the day of his visitation. And then in Mark 14, when he prayed in the garden, he was so distraught, so lamenting, that he bled from his forehead, sweat. And then in Matthew 30, uh, 27, when he spoke from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He lamented, Jesus lamented, I can lament too. How do I do it? How do I lament? And personally, I don't think there's any right way, right? There's no right way to do it. But there are some key aspects if you Google it and research it. There are some things that a lot of biblical laments have in common. And it's interesting because they're in this portion of Ezra for us. And if you take a look at your handout. I've given them to you. They address God. Usually a biblical lament will address God. They state pain, guilt, sin, problems. But they remember God's mercy and grace. They may ask questions. They may ask for help. They usually will express trust and confidence and sometimes praise or vow to praise God at some point in the future. And so you'll notice that I created this little, um, I didn't know how else to do this. I'm not great with technology. So I was trying to figure out how I could do this in a way that you could capture what I did when I looked at this text. I started pulling out the pieces of the lament. What was it that Ezra said and how did it fit with traditional laments, if you will? And so I, I, I highlighted it, it's on your handout, but I've, it's also put up here for you. And the first one that he did, of course, was he addressed God and he did it several times. He did it four times, he started with my God. And then he said, our God. And then he said, Lord God of Israel. Interesting progression when you think about it. He starts with himself, right? His God, then our God, then the God of the nation. How do we address God? Is he just our God? Or do we think about him in a more corporate way? That he is the God of this country, right? How are we praying for the God of this country? The next thing we see Ezra do is he turns to the pain, the pain I highlighted in red, and the sin, which I highlighted in orange. The pain was he felt ashamed, he felt humiliated. He felt the sword and the captivity and the plunder. But then he also felt the sin. Iniquity, guilt, forsaken commandments, took wives of the people from the land. But notice his true confession takes personal responsibility and doesn't blame others. It readily admits guilt. And he even goes so far as to say that their sin had grown up to the heavens. Stacked so high. We are so sinful. But then he turns and he remembers, <clears throat> excuse me, God's grace and mercy. And he provides us a visual reminder, he calls it a remnant, a peg, a nail, reminding them that they were formerly slaves, that there's a wall. He gives them these pictures to kind of grab a hold of, to remind them of this lament. Like, remember, God has been so good to us. So when they would see, say, a remnant, right? The feeling of that they were a remnant. You could also think of it like as a fabric remnant, a remnant. Only some of the Jews had returned to Jerusalem. Those who were there were the remnant. They represented the people God protected and preserved as his representatives and proof that he kept his promises. If you look at a, pe a peg or a nail, 
That's like being fixed in a sure place, in a safe place, which they were. They were formerly slaves. I don't think anybody had to remind them of that. I think that they were all pretty familiar with the concept of being a slave. <clears throat> and they were in the process of rebuilding the wall to fortify the city. But notice then, Ezra goes on to ask some questions. He says, and what shall we say? Should we break again your commandments? Should we not cons would you not consume us? And then finally, he asks a couple of things. He asks for help at the end, in verse 15, and he makes a statement of trust and confidence in God in Ezra 9.15. <clears throat> this is Ezra's lament over sin, and uh, the sin of compromise, really, is what he's lamenting. He grieved, he was hurting, he was confused. He had poured out his heart to the Lord for help. And in essence, that's the entire point of a lament. That's the reason you lament in those moments. I recently read a lament that has touched me deeply and is personal in nature. My, my husband is an alumni, alumnus of Purdue University. And I don't know if they put something in the water there. Uh, I, I, you are an, when you come out of there graduating, you are a lifetime fan. Like it's just, a, I mean, from the time I was pregnant, he was putting the fight song on my stomach. I mean, it was like, this, you know, and he follows sports at Purdue, you know, like a rabid, the most rabid fan you can imagine. And so I remember a couple of years ago, I was uh, in the kitchen and my husband called me over to watch something on the television and it was this young man, Tyler Trent. And he was um, at the Purdue versus Ohio State game and he was very sick with cancer at the time. And I remember him calling me in and saying, he has really strong faith in Christ and he's like, I just got to come see this. And I remember watching it and being like, really torn up when I was watching, because my kids are close to, in 2019, Rebecca was a senior. And I remember watching it and being like very like, whoa, this is a little too close to home. <laughs> I'm going to back up and going to go finish in the kitchen. And I remember like not really being able to fully dial in, but I remember him telling me the story about this young man. And as I Googled about lament, this came up again. And so I read it, and I spent some time getting to know Tyler Trent. Um, I'm really going to do my best, girls. This is a, this is a tough, um, this is hard. Tyler had cancer, and at Purdue, when you walk through the gates of um, one of the areas where the football players and the students go in, it's called Tyler's Gate. And he has a, um, a gate where the kids go through. And when the football players go through, they high five his, his picture on the side. And recently when I was at Purdue, I watched the football players do this and we entered this gate. And that the Lord would bring that this, this particular <laughs> lament to me was kind of interesting because of the connection to the campus. And although Tyler loved Jesus and his family, Purdue was second in his life. He had a... Um, a rare form of bone cancer. He was a college journalist. He was a cancer advocate. He was a rabid football fan. And even after getting chemotherapy, the next day he would sleep out with his friends and get tickets to the game. He proudly showed off a tattoo on his ankle that said, God is greater than my highs and lows. During his time at Purdue, Tyler boldly proclaimed, that his strength came from his Lord Jesus Christ. Tyler captured the media's attention, especially at the Purdue versus Ohio State game where Purdue won the victory against their rival for Tyler's honor. Tyler used every opportunity to raise awareness about cancer and about Christ. However, in 2019, Tyler passed away from this life into the presence of the Lord. And Tyler's home church pastor, Mark, wrote a lament, expressing his deep grief. And this is what he said. The morning after Tyler passed, I woke up early and wrote a lament. It was what my heart needed. I was really sad, and yet I knew that God was good. When I'm stuck between my tears and what I believe, the lament is the language 
I need. O oh Lord, we turn to you on this hard and painful day. We look to you, the author of life and the giver of grace, because our hearts are broken with grief. A young man so full of life and joy is gone. We grieve the loss of Tyler. How long, O oh Lord, must cancer steal away our loved ones? This evil disease doesn't fit with your goodness. It mars, destroys, and kills. We hate its presence in our world. Lord, we prayed for healing, and your answer is hard to accept. We watched our friend and brother persevere. 20 years just doesn't seem long enough for Tyler. We long for the day that osteosarcoma is no longer a part of our vocabulary or our prayers. We'd rather have a different story ending than this. Yet we know that you have purposes beyond what we can see. We witnessed a glimpse of your plan. In the meteoric rise of Tyler's story, we marveled at the favor and the kindness you showed upon him through his journey. We rejoiced at the platform you gave him to share his faith in Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would bring comfort to Tyler's family. They've walked beside him through this journey. They need your grace, both now and in the months and years to come. We pray for wisdom and creativity for those researching Tyler's cancer. We ask that his donated tumor and the money raised might yield life-saving options for future cancer patients. Would you heal many through Tyler's death? But even more, Jesus, we ask for your name to be lifted high through Tyler's life. You were the bedrock of his strength. You were the one who captivated his heart and gave him hope as his physical strength declined. We pray that thousands, even millions of people will be led to the kind of relationship that Tyler shared with you. And on this hard day, oh Lord, we chose, we choose to trust you. We believe you've ordained eternal purposes we can't see right now. We believe you gave Tyler every grace that he needed to persevere. We believe Jesus rose from the dead. And so on that day, one day, our tears will be wiped away once and for all. Though our pain, or through our pain and questions, we rest our hope in the one who has said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. We know this was the strength that made Tyler strong. We saw it. Tyler lived it. In Jesus' name, amen. This same pastor, Mark, uh, made these comments about lamenting. He said, lamenting is an important part of sorting out our thoughts and painful experiences. Lamenting is the language for living between the poles of a hard life and trusting in God's sovereignty. It is a prayer form for people who are waiting for the day Jesus will return and make everything right. Laments interpret the world through a biblical lens. Christian laments, a Christian laments because we all, we all know and long and understand the long arc of God's plan. It is creation, fall, redemption, restoration. We know the cause of our lament, and it is sin. We read in Revelation about the ending of all laments. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, or crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away, Revelation 21.4. A biblical lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Over a third of the Psalms were written in this gutsy, honest voice. A lament turns to God in pain, tells him why we are sad, and asks for his help to lead us to trust him more. On the back of your handout, there is a uh, a place for you to write your own lament. Now, for those of you who are rule followers like me, I want you to like understand that you don't have to follow this exactly the way I've laid it out. This is a, just a pattern if you need it. 
If you don't want to follow it, you don't have to. It just gives you something to get started. Ezra lamented compromise. Jesus lamented rejection over Israel, death, and the Father turning his face away from him on the cross. Pastor Mark lamented over Tyler's passing and the destroying effect of cancer. What are you lamenting? We have about five minutes left. I tried to speed up a little bit so that you'd have a little extra time, but I'm gonna leave you with this. I'm gonna close this in prayer. Stacy's gonna pick up here next week. We, Ezra kind of, Ezra 9 just sort of drops us off, like who can stand in this, you know, and kind of just leaves us there. Stacy's gonna pick up next week and tell us what we do after we lament, right? We're gonna lament and then we're gonna move forward. But for today, for the final five minutes, you don't have to do this. You're welcome to leave after I pray. But I wanna give you a couple minutes to think. So many times we finish, we rush, we're like, okay, we're gonna give you this, all this, and then we push you out the door. I wanna give you five minutes to sit and talk with the Lord. What's happening? What's happening? And if you are blessed enough that you don't have a lament, would you please consider praying for our nation? Would you make your lament a lament? Identify yourself with this country and lament over where we are. So it's your choice. You're welcome to go. You're welcome to stay. But I'm going to close this in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the sobering message that it's contained in Ezra 9. God, may we use the example that has been set for us through Ezra, the seriousness that he had with sin, the convictions that he held, that he expressed, that we're going to see in chapter 10 he acts on. We thank you, God, that he was a godly leader and that we have someone to follow. But I ask now that as we close, that you would meet with the women here. God, I know that my own lament, the one that I wrote, helped me greatly to sort out some things that are just messy. And yet, there's so much comfort and peace knowing that you're in control, even when we don't understand what's going on. So meet with the women Help them to be able to express the pain and know that you hear and that you care and that you're well acquainted with grief. In Jesus' name, amen.